This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hello and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii and it never got quiet. This is a half hour program that explores the Hawaiian connection with the Vietnam War. I'm your host, Vic Kraft. The Vietnam War began over a half century ago when Congress passed the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, giving then President Johnson extraordinary powers in dealing with the conflict in Southeast Asia. There were over three million service members deployed to Southeast Asia. More than 58,000 were killed. Many people today either do not know about the war or have a vague recollection of it. As time goes on, more veterans of that war will pass away, and the experiences and the wisdom these people gained will be lost forever. This program is an attempt to capture those experiences so that we may benefit from them. Wars are fought by individuals. The grand strategies and political goals become meaningless to those who World War II cartoonist Bill Malden termed the benevolent and protective brotherhood of them what has been shot at. The domino theory is irrelevant when hot lid is flying past your head. The upcoming Ken Burns documentary on the Vietnam War is already stirring up controversy. It is not the intention of this program to explore arguments for or against the war. It is simply a place where those from Hawaii who participated in that conflict can relate their experiences and feelings and their lives after the war. We named this program, It Never Got Quiet. As most of us from the time we arrived in Vietnam to the time we left, we're never too far from the sounds of war. Some of us have never truly become rid of those sounds even today. Although most of the people in what was called in-country were exposed to hostile fire, many filled supporting roles from clerks, cooks, mechanics, mechanic, medical and uh, logistics personnel, and other occupations that did not pull triggers. In a World War I American Infantry Division, there were but a handful of people in the support function by comparison to the number of those who did the actual fighting. By the time the Vietnam conflict rolled around, the complexity of war had driven the number of personnel in support functions to the point where just a little over one-third of a combat infantry division were in combat arts. Many studies continue to be done, but some do not address the larger picture, wherein all functions support the grunt or infantrymen. That means all organi organizations, be they in the same armed service or a combination of services. The question then becomes, is the technician responsible for maintaining a piece of electronics just as critical to the fighting ability of an organization? The answer would most certainly be yes. Joint operations include members from different branches of the armed forces. A good example of this was the war in the, in the Mekong Delta. The Mobile Riverine Force, or MRF, which subsequently became known as just the Riverine, or in more colloquial terms, the Brownwater Navy, was a joint force of U.S. Navy and U.S. Army personnel that patrolled the numerous rivers and tributaries that make up the Mekong Delta. The Delta is an area of over 15,600 square miles, or almost four times the size of the Big Island. To patrol such a vast area required coordination and communication. Troops were transported throughout the region by a wide variety of naval vessels, some not so conventional. These people needed to be fed, extracted, supplied with ammunition, and when necessary, evacuated, uh, evacuation of the wounded and the dead. Our guest today is Shad Kane. Shad enlisted in the U.S. Navy in 1966. He was trained to be a radar uh, repair technician and was assigned to the cruiser USS St. Paul. He later volunteered to go in-country as a member of the Riverine. After discharge from the Navy, Shad served for 34 years in the Honolulu Police Department. Shad is an author and the founder of Kalealoa Heritage Park in Kapolei. Aloha, Shad. Welcome to... Aloha. Aloha. What did you do prior to going into the military? I mean, uh, you must have had some something in mind before uh, <laughs> uh, the, the Vietnam conflict uh, grabbed you. Well, actually, I was born right here in Lima, first of all, mm -hmm. in a place called Pearl City Peninsula in 1945. At that time, uh, Pearl City Peninsula was actually Navy, I mean, it was a civilian property. Uh, been in uniform my whole life. I went to a Catholic grade school <laughs> and uh, graduated from uh, Kamehameha. And then uh, subsequent to that, went to uh, the Utah State, spent uh, a couple years at Utah State. And at that time, I was in uh, Air Force ROTC. Um, I didn't finish school, mainly because at that time, I was kind of somewhat disappointed in myself and the fact that uh, I was really kind of hoping for a career in the military. And so I was uh, part of the uh, uh, Utah State's uh, Air Force ROTC, and before you go into your junior year, you got to declare whether you uh, want to go into the pilot's program or the navigator's program. But I had my heart set 
from being a, being a pilot. And uh, in order to get into that program, we had to go to the University of Utah in Salt Lake City and uh, take a test in a simulated uh, aircraft. And uh, I, hate, I hate saying it, but I didn't do too well in that. So <laughs> I became very disappointed, you know. So I actually left school mm -hmm. and returned home. And uh, at that time, my brother was actually in the, uh, the Navy. So during the time I was home, I decided to join the Navy. And in 1966, October of 1966, I went to boot camp in San Diego. And uh, subsequent to that, uh, my whole first year was I attended different Navy schools. So after boot camp, I spent some time in San Diego's uh, basic electricity school. And then I, I had declared to become a, uh, a radar then. So uh, I went to uh, Treasure Island, which is an island in San Francisco Bay, mm -hmm. where I went to uh, the Navy's uh, radar A school. So I spent that whole first year going to, uh, going to school, and uh, subsequent to getting out of uh, uh, radar A school, I was assigned to the, uh, the uh, St. Paul Heavy Cruiser. And so two years, uh, 67, 68, I spent two cruises uh, on the St. Paul, and we were involved in naval gunfire support uh, in the area of the uh, DMZ between uh, South and North, North Vietnam. So, and we were actually exposed to fire during that time. As a matter of fact, that first year we got hit on the on our port, uh, port bow, where we ended up having to go back to Subic. But uh, uh, in those waters, I became uh, extremely uh, impressed with uh, the riverboats because oftentimes we would meet with the PCFs, which were such slightly larger, much larger than uh, uh, PBRs, uh, river patrol boats. So I became very impressed with the sailors working on those, uh, working on those boats. So it was in '68 where I decided to leave the St. Paul and uh, join those uh, those sailors who were working at the Brownwater Navy. So that's how it all started. I came back to San Diego. I went to uh, survival school in San Diego, Coronado Island, mm -hmm. and then uh, my first assignment was to uh, uh, participate or assign to the uh, Commander River Patrol for Tel 5. And uh, we, we uh, coordinated uh, communications between the, uh, the river boats and the command structure associated with the naval uh, command structure within Benlock. Benlock is about uh, 90 miles Salt Lake City. So my first assignment was at uh, Benlock in South Vietnam. Okay. And then, excuse me, you uh, went uh, further north, I believe, up the, what we have to explain to people is the, the vast area that had to be okay. patrolled. Okay. As, I, as I mentioned, four times the size of the, the Big Island. Uh, it's a huge area, the number of people that you had, the number of assets that needed to be controlled. Uh, I think you mentioned to me uh, the, the accidental incursions into Cambodia. Yeah. And, uh, the, uh, 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 River Patrol Flotilla 5 coordinated communications mm -hmm. out of Benlock. Mm -hmm. Benlock is, like I said, about 90 miles south of, of, uh, of uh, Saigon. But we coordinated the uh, activities and communications with several river divisions that were all on the uh, Van Cote River. There's actually two rivers that's actually the intersect just south of where we were located, the Van Cote and Van Cote Dong rivers. Those two rivers uh, originate in Cambodia, in the area that is referred to as the uh, Parrot's Beak. Mm -hmm. So uh, much of the time, I would, say, I would have to say that most of our work was, even for the, the river boats, was kind of boring with respect to small periods where it became extremely exciting, okay? So uh, there were several uh, Navy bases along the, uh, the Van Cote River where we monitored communications with the, uh, the river boats. Okay, let me be really clear. It's, it's not just uh, PBRs or river boats. Uh, amongst the boats that, that we had assigned to our command were uh, what we referred to as Zippos, which were 
plain swing boats. Mm -hmm. There were monitors, which uh, were uh, boats that had a 105 howitzer mounted on them, and that we had tango boats. And these tango boats uh, would transport uh, draftees and Navy SEALs, and we would set them up at ambush in different places along the river, sizzle, uh, river system along the Van Cote River. For example, it was not just simply patrolling the rivers. That oftentimes uh, that involved just checking uh, uh, papers on sampans and making sure that uh, these were friendly sampans and not sampans that were transporting uh, weapons down south. And because this is a period in time, 67, 68, where the VC were pretty far south already and they had integrated into different uh, communities and villages along the Van Cote and Van Dong River. And oftentimes, they made their presence known at night. So during the day, they would integrate into the villages. And the villages that were very concerned about making their presence known because they didn't want to have a difficult situation with the VC. So oftentimes, we did not know a whole lot about with respect to where these people were. So uh, uh, part of our job was not just communicating, but to assist with uh, insertion of uh, uh, draftees and Navy SEALs along different areas along the river system. And oftentimes we would identify free fire zones and no fire zones. So oftentimes the uh, no fire zones were places where uh, uh, civilians had lived. The big problem for our boats is that oftentimes at uh, these VCs, we would receive fire more from no fire zones than from free fire zones. And this was the situation up when you go further north uh, along the Van Cote River. So subsequent to six months at, Van, uh, at Ben Luck, uh, I was reassigned to uh, Ben Keo. So Ben Keo is along the, uh, the Van Cote River, and it's about 20 clicks, 20 miles south of the uh, Cambodian border. And it was during this period, 67, 68, where uh, we were experiencing a lot of firefights with respect to that, that area along the Cambodian border. So uh, on one end, and our boats oftentimes would, would uh, try to stay within South Vietnam, but there's no signs. <laughs> <laughs> so there was one situation, and I hate saying this, but it, it probably happened often, but on one occasion, uh, it was discovered that we actually went into uh, Cambodia, and that uh, we, were made aware that our boats were in Cambodia. So anyway, I think that was actually on national news way back at that time. So that, during that period of time, I was assigned to the uh, NOC staff actually in Tainan province. Mm -hmm. So Tainan province butts right up against the Cambodian border. So that was an extremely hot area, not just along the, the Van Cote River, but uh, also on land. So uh, I'm not sure if our listeners are familiar with the Monkey Mountain. Mm -hmm. So Monkey Mountain is actually in uh, Tainan province. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, it's a mountain that was uh, had a lot of BC tunnels, not just uh, residents, but operations within the Monkey Mountain. So, so I spent uh, my first half of that, that year in uh, Benlock. Can we come back to that in a minute? Because uh, we need to take a break here. Uh, for a couple of messages, and we'll be right back with Shad Kane. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Hello, I'm Helen Dora Hyden, the host of Voice of the Veteran, seen here live every Thursday afternoon at 1 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. As a fellow veteran and veterans advocate with over 23 years experience serving veterans, active duty, and family members, I hope to educate everyone on benefits and accessibility services by inviting professionals in the field to appear on the show. In addition, I hope to plan on inviting guest veterans to talk about their concerns and possibly offer solutions. As we navigate and work together through issues, we can all benefit. Please join me every Thursday at 1 p.m. for the Voice of the Veteran. Aloha. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. But I have a story, and I don't know where to start. I feel alone in a crowd. I can't sleep. I feel overwhelmed. I don't even know who I am anymore. I still have nightmares. I can't live like this anymore. I'm really not so good. But are you ready to listen? Tell me, 15 minutes went by already? Well, 
<laughs> we're with Shad Kane, and we're talking about his experiences in the Mekong Delta during the Vietnam War. You mentioned something uh, earlier about the, the troops. You said the draftees. There is a huge age difference even when you're 19 and 23. You had mentioned that uh, most of the guys within the Riverine were in their early 20s to late yeah. 20s. Yeah, most of us assigned to the uh, river divisions. We're all in, for the most part, we were all in our 20s. So we were, uh, most of us were like 22, 23, 24, even older than that. So most of us had already been in the Navy for a while. But uh, we, uh, we worked often with draftees. And, uh, you know, what really surprised me about the draftees at that time, most of them were teenagers, at least to us. They looked for the most part like kids. So we were kind of somewhat, so as sailors, you, you got to understand, we're sailors. Okay? <laughs> we were just surprised that there were so many young kids drafted at that time that we were actually taking and setting up in ambush positions at night. And the striking thing to us is that uh, it was very obvious that these young guys were kind of really, most of them looked like they were all underweight. Uh, and the ones that we worked with, because we were in a very hot area, most of them had actually been in Vietnam for a while. So they've experienced firefights, those that, that were assigned to us in our particular area. So they were somewhat uh, familiar with getting involved in firefights. So it was very obvious to me that the fighting kind of took their toll on these young men just by looking at them and having a simple conversation with them it was almost difficult to kind of get a sense that they're they, they look like they were somewhere else if you can understand what i'm saying when you're having a conversation with somebody which in our minds was really important stuff because we're taking these guys and setting up in ambush the next that night to set them up it seems like almost most of them that I had a personal conversation with over lunch they seem almost in a daze and like uh, they were they, were, they don't feel anything. They were just like simple machines, just responding to orders and duties and what they got to do and just do them. So we were kind of very, uh, it's not just me, it's even the sailors that, that work side by side with, they all kind of had that, we all kind of felt bad for them, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, we're in boats, we're on a base, so we feel safe. But we're taking these young guys up along the riverbanks and with our zippers, we burn the foliage, to clear when we f open fire with our 50s on to make sure there's no enemies in that area. But then we have to, to drop them off. And oftentimes we're dropping them off not on land. Oftentimes it's really hard to tell how deep the water is. So oftentimes we're actually dropping these young draftees in deep water. And we're watching them struggle in the water. And it, it really uh, breaks your heart to see us putting in them, these young kids, in that kind of situation. Mm -hmm. it's the, that's the kind of stuff I'll never forget. I'll just never forget what we did. Our effort was to help them, but oftentimes, uh, when you look at the specific times and circumstances under which we were involved in, it's almost difficult for us to feel good about what we were doing. So it, it's a tough part of, of uh, the Vietnam War. You said memories. Uh, I know that you have a, a marvelous sense of service. You had to have had in order to volunteer to go to the Riverine. But you carried it on after you got out of the Navy and actually ended up at the Honolulu uh, Police Department, spending 34 years there. Do you reflect upon that time as being in, similar to being in combat or? your experiences in combat have any relation to your time in the HPD? It does. Uh, and I, it's more than just that. I think it's our generation that we came from. Mm -hmm. There's a sense of commitment and con making contributions. Uh, and that's what life is all about. You know, we, we're defined by the contributions and sacrifices we make. That's who we are. And uh, I, as I said, I spent my whole life in uniform, all the way from kindergarten. I was in uniform. <laughs> <laughs> so that sense of service, I think, is just kind of this, it's a part of you after a while. And uh, that's how, uh, I hate talking about myself, but uh, I think that's kind of how I define myself. You know, whenever I get to the point where I'm about to leave this world, I want to be able to look back and feel good 
from things I did. And I, I'm, I don't think I'm the only person. I'm sure a lot of people who do volunteer service, volunteer work, in similar kinds of projects to the Kalailo Heritage Park, I think they all, they all develop that kind of sense of sacrifice and contribution. Not so much sacrifice, but to doing things for other people. The Heritage Park is that kind of place. The Heritage Park is for future generations to understand what life was like in the past. So uh, I think everyone, uh, our generation, kind of pretty much feel the same way regarding if I can bring that up, uh, just to hold this up, Chad wrote this book. It's called uh, Cultural Kapolei, and basically you did an awful lot of research uh, on the history of the first Polynesians that came into that area uh, down by Fort the old Barber's Point. And uh, if you haven't already, folks, uh, take advantage of it. He's a great docent. He'll take you around the park. Uh, it's a fascinating history, it's fascinating heritage for all of us. Uh, you have left uniform, but uh, you still have a sense of duty to provide the community with a link to the past, but as you said, uh, a direction to the future. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we wanted to do when we were in service, was we felt that we were doing our duty and helping the country, helping the community. And whereas you took it to the next step and you actually put a uniform on to serve and to protect. I wanna thank you for that, by the way. But uh, yeah, I, I admire people who at least recognize that in themselves. And, and I wanna thank you again for that. Tell us a little about the park though. I mean, what caused you to get involved with that? I'll try to make this real fast. <laughs> <Good> <laughs> I'll luck. try my best I can. <laughs> I actually grew up to uh, assimilate into the Western world. It wasn't until later on. I was through my grandfather. My grandfather was a blacksmith on the Big Island, the Portuguese ancestry. So there was always cowboy stuff around. So I, as I grew up, I, I actually got more involved in cowboy stuff. I had horses, rode horses. I did some roping and all those kinds of things. I read a lot about the Indian culture, the Indian Plains Indians, the Northern Plains, the, uh, the Cheyenne, the Santee Sioux, Ogallala Sioux. One day my wife and I went on a Western tour, and we, uh, we flew to uh, Spokane. I mean, we flew to Seattle, rented a car, drove to Spokane, drove across the Coraline Pass, stopping grounds at the Nez Perce Indians, into Montana, Bozeman, to Big Horn Memorial. We went all the way, Wyoming, all the way to uh, Pahasapa, the, great, the uh, Black Hills. And part of that was because of its sacred nature to the Northern Plains Indians. At that time, I wanted to find a place where they were actually making Indian crafts because I was already involved in making Indian feather work. And we found this place called Prairie's Edge. And that, very interesting. Uh, my wife and I enjoyed looking at all the Indian stuff that was purchased from Native American Indians. But I accidentally bumped into a, an old guy. When I took a look at him, I suddenly realized I was looking at my first real Indian. Because most of the Indians I know are half Hawaiian, part Cherokee, half of Hawaiian, uh, part uh, Caucasian, part Cherokee, or part Indian, so I never really saw a real Indian. On that day, uh, I was stunned by standing next to this guy, had to be in his 80s, long white hair, cowboy clothes, big cowboy buckle, cowboy hat. His face had so many wrinkles, I don't think I ever saw another man with that many wrinkles in his face. The conversation went like this, and that's how it all started. We started talking about Indian culture. We started talking about all the battles between the, uh, the Northern Plains with the 7th Cavalry. And it came down to this defining moment. He asked me, what tribe I belong to? I hesitated. And I said I was Hawaiian. Okay. I must have said that hundreds of times before that day. On that particular day, they actually heard me say it. I don't know if it makes sense to you or any of your listeners, but I actually heard me say it. The next thing he said is, you know, you come from so far away, and you know my culture more than my children and my grandchildren. You know what I heard him say? He was talking about me. So when I came back home, I gave up all the Indian stuff I had, I quit doing cowboy things. I, I moved, I rented 10 acres <laughs> up in Campbell Estate, and I started doing trail riding. And it started with that. It started with all the many discoveries I made and that ancient Hawaiian past. 
and it ended with us working at the Kalailo Heritage Park and restoring a cultural landscape. And it's a marvelous work that's in progress. Uh, you've had uh, university people come down there, botanists, uh, biologists, and archaeologists, and actually showing how large the community was and what it did and uh, how it survived. But there's, there are lessons there for us. It's, it's really a partnership. I don't want to make it seem like it's just us who's involved in the Heritage Park. It's a 501c3 private nonprofit, the Kalailo Heritage and Legacy Foundation. And that uh, we, we got a right of entry back in 2010. The land was actually conveyed from the Navy to the state in 2010. And that we got a right of entry uh, back at that time. And then in 2010, we got the lease, I mean, I'm sorry, of 2015, we got the lease. We have a 501c3 and we have an eight member board. So it, it kind of uh, all started with that. But however, I don't want your listeners getting the impression it's just us. The success of the Heritage Park has been the result of the many partnerships that we've established. It's a Heritage Park. So the idea is not to, it's, it's not meant to change. So it's meant to restore what once was. So we work in partnership, for example, with the University of Hawaii, Manoa, West Oahu, Leeward, with respect to their the botany department. So they help identify the native plants that once thrived in that area. So we. It's an effort to restore, not, not preservation of the cultural landscape, to restore the biological resources that once said that's one example of many. That's great. I'd like to thank you, Shad, for being on the program. Uh, we would love to have some feedback. We're also looking for people to interview. If you have some comments or would like to appear on the program, please send us an email at 808 Vietnam Vet at gmail.com. I would like to thank the staff here uh, at Think Tech Hawaii for all their support and assistance. And truly without them, there would never be and never got quiet. If you'd like to know more about the information uh, on Kalealoa Heritage Park, please go to their website at http www.khlfoundation.org. Mahalo.